St. Louis, King of France Almighty God, in his wondrous wisdom, has chosen his saints from every rank of life, some poor and unknown to the world while they are in it, others great and powerful, others young and weak by nature, but strong in grace and love. No two have been exactly alike, even in their way of pleasing our Lord. And this is a proof that no matter what our station may be, no matter whether we are rich or poor, wise or ignorant, nothing can stand in the way of our sanctification, excepting our own want of generous, self-denying love. There have been persons whose riches and power seem to come between them and God. But in order that we may believe that no wealth or greatness need draw us away from heavenly things, it has been the divine will that the lives of many royal persons have become known, giving us an example of extraordinary holiness. The character of St. Louis, King of France, shines out brightly in the 13th century in which he lived. He was the son of Louis VIII and the pious Queen Blanche of Castile, and from this good mother he early learned to love God. Very often she would say to him, I would rather see you lose your crown, I would rather see you die, than your soul should be stained by mortal sin. And these words fixed themselves so deeply in his childish heart that he felt the greatest horror of offending God. His love for prayer was great, and thus his life was singularly free from human passions and he learned to prize spiritual things far above the grandeur of earth. Many who are placed in high stations lose that simple truthfulness which is so pleasing to God. But it was not so with Lewis. He would rather have borne any suffering than speak a false or deceitful word. Although in those times it was not possible to be taught as much as we have the power of learning now, he applied himself diligently to his studies especially the Latin, because it helped him to read the Holy Scriptures and the writings of the fathers of the church in which he delighted. When Louis was 21 years of age and no longer under the control of his parents, he did not take up a gay and worldly life. His was the piety which comes from a heart all given to God. Not from constraint, and therefore he continued as thoughtful, as serious, as devout, as he had been from his earliest days. Although he was now at liberty to be his own master, Louis treated his mother with great reverence and obedience, always seeking her advice and following her counsels with great docility. About this time, the Emperor of Constantinople came to ask help from France in a war he was carrying out against the Greeks. Promising Louis the whole sacred crown of thorns worn by Jesus during his passion if it was taken from the Venetians who then possessed it. The thought of gaining so great a treasure, one which had truly rested on the sacred head of the Lord he loved so well, delighted Louis, and he readily helped Baldwin with money and troops, and afterwards received the holy relic at Sens in the presence of a large number of ecclesiastics and nobles. Besides this, a piece of the true cross was given to him, and the young king built a chapel to receive these relics, which is still to be seen in Paris. In the month of May 1249, the king embarked for the Holy Land to engage in the Crusades, and when the army had reached Damietta, he made an address to the nobles who had followed him, saying that while he was there, he wished to be considered not as a king, but as one of themselves. He also reminded them that their purpose was to fight for the cause of God, that if they died it was for love of him, while if they conquered it was for his glory, not their own. Inspired with courage by his words, the soldiers fought bravely, Damietta was conquered, and King Louis remained there during the summer, giving to all an example of piety. A few months later the King of Poitiers arrived with more soldiers and they then resolved to besiege Cairo, the great capital of Egypt. During their march, they were frequently attacked by the Saracens, but the French were always victorious, 
until at length a disease broke out amongst them, which carried off a number of their men. In this calamity, St. Louis was as calm as he had been during their success. He went amongst his troops, encouraging them to submit with patience to the will of God, reminding them of the eternal reward of heaven, which would more than make up for all they had to bear on earth. Next, it pleased God to try this holy king by further suffering, for he took the infection himself, and when, resolving to return to Damietta, he had ordered his troops to start there, they were surprised by a party of Saracens who made him a prisoner. Although he was now in captivity, Louis received all the care and respect due to his rank, and being attended by clever physicians was soon cured of his illness. But he had to remain in the hands of the Saracens and bear many annoyances from them. During his imprisonment, the king contrived to pursue as far as possible the usual rule of life, omitting neither fast nor penance, and to every inconvenience he submitted with sweetness and humility. When the ransom for his liberty was being arranged, the Saracens required from him some form of oath which he deemed displeasing to God, so he would not make it. When his relations and friends entreated him to yield, that he might return more speedily to them, he said, God is my witness that I love you dearly, but Jesus and his cross are far dearer, and I will not offend him by doing what is proposed to me. The Saracens were furious at his firmness. With a drawn sword at his throat, they threatened him with death. But he said, You can but kill my body. God alone has charge of my soul, and you cannot harm that. So at length they released him, and he returned to France. Now that he was once more in his own kingdom, the good king visited the different states, leaving everywhere a remembrance of his benevolence and piety. To all who were poor or suffering, he was merciful and gentle. But to the profane and wicked, he was most severe, making a law that for oaths and blasphemies the offenders should be punished by having the tongue pierced with a hot iron. But in ordering this, he told them that, if by bearing the penalty he could banish all impure and profane speech from his kingdom, he would endure it with thankfulness and joy. No great or lasting success had been granted him in the first crusade he had undertaken. But Louis had a longing to repair again to the Holy Land. Accordingly, preparations were made but when they were proposing to attack Tunis, illness once more broke out in the camp. The king's eldest son died, and Louis himself was attacked with it, and felt so sure that he should die, that he spent his remaining time in preparing to meet God and arranging for the welfare of the people he was leaving. His instructions to his son Philip, who was to be the next king, were full of beauty and holiness. He entreated him to make the service of God his chief care choose the guidance of holy and wise priests, and be ruled by their counsels, to be charitable to the poor, and just to all his subjects, to separate himself from all detractors, to hate evil, and spread truth and peace abroad in his kingdom. When the disease gained ground, Louis received the last sacraments with great devotion. And as the end drew near, he caused himself to be laid upon a bed strewn with ashes, where he expired on the 25th of August, 1270, after reigning 44 years. Many abbeys and monasteries were founded by this good king, who lived and died in the practice of true and simple piety, valuing lightly his earthly greatness, using it as a gift of God, for which he must render an account and setting before him as the only thing his heart desired that heavenly crown which should be his through all eternity.